All right, over the weekend, some people went outside and they decided they were going to protest because they need some haircuts. Specifically, they're protesting the fact that they can't leave their houses, and they're going a little stir-crazy. And you can see some of that in their argumentation. Some of them even were saying that the coronavirus is bullshit, but we're still wearing a lot of protection. In two of the states where people were protesting, guess what? Their coronavirus numbers went up. Who could have ever have guessed that? And I get it. Maybe this weekend, watching concerts with Lady Gaga and all these other liberal people aren't your jam. Just tell us who you need to convince you to stay at home so that you don't have to go outside and protest. Is it some of the blue collar guys? I'm pretty sure Larry the Cable Guy isn't really doing much. My only ask is, if you're gonna go outside and exercise your American rights, then do us a solid. At least make your signs good. Most of them suck. If you need a reason to stay at home and you don't like what I'm saying, hey, watch this show. Because love us, hate us, sometimes it looks about the same. You're watching Early Late Night. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Early Late Night, a show that's mildly more entertaining than watching celebrities do nothing on Instagram. I know the world sucks sometimes, but don't worry. I read the news so you don't have to. Our top story. Facebook says they now have a superpower in combating the coronavirus. Yes, it's called muting your friends who post fake news. A group of protesters waving Confederate flags and wearing Donald Trump hats chanted lock her up outside of Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer's office. Said Governor Whitmer, I'm already inside. Idiots. Bill Cosby's lawyer says that the comedian would not survive COVID-19. That's a shame, said his fan. Donald Trump says that 29 states are in extremely good shape, which you know you can take to the bank, especially coming from a man who looks like this. According to Trump, the states that look in the best shape? Colorado and Wyoming. They're nice, easy rectangles. They don't have any crazy borders like Maryland. People are saying Maryland's a little crazy with its borders that go like this. The same Louisiana pastor who held an Easter service with over 1,300 people is now asking for his followers to give their full stimulus checks to the church. Come on, said the pastor. You're gonna die from coronavirus anyway. In the new Michael Jordan documentary, Barack Obama was jokingly listed as former Chicago resident instead of being listed as former president. Even worse, Michael Jordan was listed as sneaker designer. Because of the coronavirus, students may be allowed to take the SATs at home. It might be the only way to get into top-tier college classes, like this one. Las Vegas may open back up next month with dealers wearing gloves and masks. Because what happens in Vegas stays for about 14 days, even if you're not showing symptoms. You know, this is gonna make things way easier for Danny Ocean. Oh, and finally, Amazon says they will be testing all employees for COVID-19. The test results are expected to come back in five to seven business days, unless you have Amazon Prime. And that'll do it for our monologue. Let's do the crossover. All right, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most difficult aspects about this coronavirus is the fact that many American families are really being affected financially. One of the things that we decided to do here on Early Late Night is to take a closer look, not nah, at Seth's bit. We decided to go a little John Oliver style. Raph! What? I'm sorry. Raph! Yeah, Je Yo. Je Jeff, is that Raph. you? Raph! Yeah, uh, ask me what day it is. I, you know, I'd rather not, dude. Come on, ask me what day it is. Dude, I think everybody knows. I'll give it a hint. What is, what is that? I don't know what that is. So it's a wooden uh, one hitter. Oh, okay. Sorry, your Charlie Chaplin acting was just, it was so good. <laughs> Jeff, what day is it? Hitler's birthday. <laughs> Why would we be celebrating Hitler's birthday? I don't know, Raph. That's what I'm asking you. Why are you making me work on your holiday? No, no. I'm, I'm just trying to get high for 420, you psycho. Okay, well, good. I'm glad you are getting high. That's great. But uh, here's the thing. What else do you want to talk about? The anniversary of Columbine? People are just trying to enjoy their weed today, Raph. <sighs> okay, well, listen. I'm very sorry that I we're making you work. I'm sorry. <laughs> on a holiday, I, I apologize, but I feel it's important for yeah. the people. 
Yes. And it's uh, uh, always a holiday on quarantine. Who's been celebrating 420 on 420? It's been 420 all April and all of March. And if you're doing it right, first half of February uh, and pretty much every day before that, 420 is not that special. I uh, so high right now. What's the difference? You look tragically high, sir. No, rap. I got these red eyes from cutting onions. Of course I'm high right now. I've been high this whole time. Yep, I figured Aren't that. you high? Tell me you've made a green screen joke, right? Green? No. Because you're high. This is this is truly the back of Los Angeles. No green screen here. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Because you've got that uh, excellent uh, uh, outer veranda up on the uh, Hollywood Hills. I have been chopping onions. I've been dicing them, slicing them. Okay. I've been uh, sauteing them. Um, I'm really getting into this on the quarantine, and it's really easy to get into because I am so high the whole time. You know, that's that's great. You know, I've been actually doing a lot of microwaving still. Uh, were you one of the guys on Tiger King? Good Lord. Treat yourself with something, you know, besides expired meats. They eat just very kidding. well for themselves, I'm so sir. High right now. I, when you made me call in on this rap, like, this, I, I listened to the Skype beat mm -hmm. and was actually thinking, this is kind of my jam. I'm that kind of high. Can you replicate what the Skype beat sounds like to you? It's pretty dope. Okay. It is very dope. Boop, boop, boop. And then imagine like a beat underneath that's like. <laughs> like you'll think you're in like a Virgin America bathroom except better. Oh, wow. A Virgin See, America waiting room at LAX going boop, boop, boop. Boop, boop, boop. See, because I actually boop, hear boop. it as more boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Rap. Are you high right now? That is not how the Skype beat sounds. Oh, dude, it's Look. totally how it sounds. Jesus. No, Hispanic people be hearing Skype like, boo, 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 and then like horns underneath, probably some horns. But white white people be hearing that Skype like, boo, 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 you know, like a, 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 a David Guetta type remix. Mm -mm. See, I don't hear racial tones, so that's just mm -mm. A, little, a little different than... How oh, uh, next thing you're going to tell me, you don't even know what black Instagram is. Been on it. Why? Because I'm high all the time. You watch the Breakfast Club? <sighs> wow. This I is... do. They're Skyping in, for Christ's sakes, and Jeff, I'm watching that. let me just that. tell you something real quick, okay? Yeah. Manila Folder here. You will never explain to me what black Twitter or black Instagram ever is. Thank you very much. Okay. I heard Hey, what does you... uh, WFH stand for? I don't know. What does it stand for? Weed for happiness. It is the end of the world, Raph. You're having me work? You're having me do a correspondence bit, do you see what you've interrupted here? The sweet, sweet comforting strokes of a one Bob Ross, the late Bob Ross. To do, uh, you, you asked me to throw a benefit concert on 420, bro? I thought it would be a good idea. Oh, did you? What am I, Lady Gaga? I don't have the great forces of the three largest networks to send me a webcam for real Lady Gaga. You got a webcam. NBC, CBS, and ABC all air this thing. And everybody's working off of the eye camera? What the? What the hell, Raph? That's almost as lazy as you telling me to do this stupid benefit concert. Hashtag in this together or something. I don't know. I'm so high right now. Listen, I just thought it would be a good idea to get some people who are weed-friendly advocates to help out those people who are affected right now, who are at home, probably yeah, wanting to get DM high, and who have DM. truly been affected by this. Yeah, and if they had shown up after I DM'd them on the IG, Drake, Diddy, Keith, Mick, John, Ringo, I, I DM'd the band Simple Plan. He, they've got the Zoom password. They've got it. I gave it to them sitting on Zoom. I'm the only one here. Nobody in the waiting room. Nothing. Do I have pants on? Of course not. It's 420. This is a benefit show. Dignity, people. So high right now. All right. Well, so I'm guessing that's a no on the benefit concert then. Uh, I'm as disappointed as you, Raph, because it was to benefit my weed habit. And, uh, you know, not to say I'm not able to afford it. Uh, stimulus check. Pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. <laughs> uh, hopefully, uh, they DM me back. Uh, Mike Berbiglia was supposed to come through. Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm just, I've been so high, I can't even tell if I DM'd them. I don't know if I've been in Chris Barton's studio. I don't know what is real, what is reality, what is a dream. A was supposed to be a beautiful day, and instead, 
all I'm doing is failing. You're not failing. Every second. Jeff, Jeff, you succeeded here. I watched Tiger King and envied the living conditions of those meth heads. I was like, look at them. At least they get to get outside and fish that expired meat out of the dumpster. I would kill to be outside fishing expired meat out of a dumpster. Jeff, can I tell you something? You are not failing. I am so high right. You are a wonderful correspondent. You have done excellent work for us here. And here's the Do thing. Do you know how high they had to be? Do you know how high they had to be? They ate, they ate expired meat every single day and put it on pizzas for paying customers. How high do you have to be to eat it? How high do you have to be to serve it? So high. I've been to a Golden Corral on a Tuesday morning. You telling me that that's fresh meat? I've eaten it because I have been high for a while. Do you think we'll have buffets after the world ends, Raph? Do you think they'll let us have buffets? Of course they will, Jeff. Of course they oh, will. Oh, hi. Um, I hope that you're enjoying yourself. Edibles can be a little scary. Don't make your own. Don't grow your own weed. Just, just hashtag we're in this together. Uh, uh, see below, I'll put my Venmo account. Just No, no. Dollars. All right. I think we're, we're cutting you off. Jeff, again, I can't stress this enough. You're a wonderful uh, team member here at Early Late Night, and we thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, thank you, Raph. It is so good to be high right now. I hope everybody is high at home, and say hi to yourself when you say hi to me from a distance. I'm so high. Thank you very much for your report, Jeff McKinnon. When we come back, we will have our interview with Julian Fernandez. Ladies and gentlemen, we continue our run of great guests over on the show here today. We always like to feature not just the new talent that you may have heard, but maybe may have even seen. This uh, young man, uh, he not only opened for Dana Carvey, which I have questions about this because lifelong dream, uh, totally understand how amazing this would be. I want to ask him about his impersonations. I want to ask him about everything he's got going on and all the things that, of course, got put on hold with the coronavirus. But you, we today have a comedian, an impressionist, and as billed on his website, and I think I need some clarification on this, Latino-ish. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show today, <laughs> Julian Fernandez. How are you doing, sir? Yay! Hey, I'm doing great. How you doing, buddy? Very well. Okay, let's get straight to it, because I got brown people who yell at me if I don't ask. Latino-ish. <laughs> what exactly does that mean? Yeah. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's from a bit that I do in my stand-up, uh, where I talk about how, for a long time uh, in my own life, I, I, I've come across as very ethnically ambiguous. Mm -hmm. uh, I always usually get different guesses as to my ethnicity, which is usually like Hawaiian, Native American. Uh, I'll get Filipino sometimes. I'll get mixed. And re very rarely is it the first guess is Mexican. Uh, if it's other Mexicans, for sure, that could be the first guess. But for the most part, people will either be like, oh, well, you got to be part this and part that. Like, no, nah, just, I just look like this. I just look mm -hmm. swollen. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I look swollen and ambiguous. I don't know what to tell them. Uh, so, and it, it wasn't even just like from a physical uh, point where I felt ambiguous, but also from culturally, like I'm not at maybe as in tune with my culture as I, I would like to be, but that doesn't mean I'm as far removed. So I never consider myself whitewashed. And I never liked being uh, referred to as whitewash, so I came up with the word Latino-ish. That works, so, dude. You I... are Latino. You are Latino, and but you know, you know, there's some stuff that's like, oh, well, maybe they're not. I don't, you don't know. <laughs> so I always tell people, you can always be Latino-ish if you're if you're part if you're part Latin, if you're full Latin, if you're if if you got you know, especially with these DNA tests now, everyone's mm -hmm. like a like a percentage, so everyone can be a little Latino-ish. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a moment of my own pause and reflection when uh, Antonio Banderas got nominated for an Oscar this year. And they kept saying, Oscar so mm -hmm. white, Oscar so white. And they're like, well, there's yeah. only one person of color that was nominated. And I had a moment where I was like, isn't he? Oh, are we going to do that weird thing where we're just <laughs> not going to include this guy? Because that whole, uh, he was desperado. Yeah. He's good in my book. Can we give him a passing grade? Yeah. And it was like the same thing when uh, I'm a big Guillermo del Toro fan, uh, yeah. and when he when he won Best Director Oscar, I got a little upset because <laughs> so it's like now I remember it was Natalie Portman and it was Ron Howard introducing it. The <laughs> Natalie Portman, 
And here are the five male nominees. Everyone's like, oh! <laughs> and then the first person they show is Guillermo del Toro, just sitting there, just being a delightful butterball that he is, <laughs> not hurting anybody. And then he wins. I'm still like, but yeah, she had that snark. I, I get it. I understand. I get it. Yeah. But come on. Like, <sighs> here's the good news about minorities they should yeah. really uh, construct a show where they just pit us all against each other continuously because <laughs> it's not like we don't, you know, agree with Natalie Portman of being like, it was a shame that yes, we didn't get a certain person yeah, there nominated. Should, there should be more female director nominees, totally but at the time get it. I, I, I was all game for Guillermo del Toro. So part of me was just like, don't take this away from him. Like, right, right, right. damn it. <laughs> and it's hard but because in the I, end, well, he won, and that was good. Yeah, yeah. In the end, he won. So, <laughs> and and I had the issue of with uh, Guillermo del Toro, where I was getting to that point where I was like, "Didn't we do this already with him?" And then people had to remind me, they're like, "No, we didn't do it with Pan's Labyrinth." And I was like, "Oh, fuck!" Right. Well, hey, Natalie Portman, you get in line because oh wait, they've only had like five <laughs> ladies nominated for. Well, ugh, ugh. Yeah. You know what? Let's just kick out a couple like, of these white like guys. You, Would they like, even notice? Yeah. Like, like still keep the same winner. I like, I'm all on board. I'm all on board. Yeah. There should be more female directors. Well, well that, but it's, it's hard for me to, to be on board with <laughs> that remark. <laughs> when like the next frame is just the person I want to win. Just like, <laughs> we all, just like I, I'm a man. I <laughs> right. Whoops! I'm like, oh man. Like I get it. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a tough one. But don't worry. When I get to the yeah, Hunger, but Hunger Game versions of ethnicity games, you know, we'll really come down to who deserves uh, being awarded the most. Um, but let's say this. Okay. Right. So one of the things that I've been dying to ask you about is. I grew up as a kid doing impressions, I'm sure much like you did, where you, you yeah. feel like, oh, how do I make this thing work? And then you start doing comedy yeah. and you get to do impressions. And then you get to open for like the guy who does impressions. I got I got I gotta actually correct you on that. I didn't open for him, but I did do a sh I, I did a show with him. Um, okay. And not well, a stand up, I did a I did a TV show. So what does that entail? Because I thought that you were opening from, so my apologies on that. What does working <laughs> with him, because that is even more uh, impressive, what does that entail? So, uh, well, just as context, uh, I, I did a show uh, a couple a few years back called First Impressions uh, with Dana Carvey. Uh, and the show was basically, every episode would be three impressionists. Uh, doing basically improv games with Dana Carvey and a celebrity guest. Mm. Uh, and we'd have to rattle off different impressions or try to showcase as many as we can. And the audience there would vote. And at the end of the episode, one person would get uh, an X amount of money and win, win, win the show. Mm. Um, I lost somehow. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but since it was all around this kind of almost judging of the impressions and the comedy and everything. Uh, we didn't really get to have a lot of time beforehand to interact with Dana Carvey and the yeah. guest. Um, so it was just kind of like we're on stage and then boom, we're, we basically meet him and perform for him right then and there. Uh, it was, it was crazy. I, one of my, one of the first things I did was just a bit of stand up that I do where I talk about how I have a very, I have a very deep voice and it sounds like I ate James Earl Jones. <laughs> I can literally walk around and just be like, I'm looking for my son, Hakeem. <laughs> like, I can do that. This, this looks Simba. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. <laughs> like, you know, that's what everyone's got going on right here. <laughs> so I did that. And then he just really enjoyed it. Gave me a great compliment. We do the show. And the show was so, it was so much fun to do. Uh, Freddie Prince Jr. was hosting. Kate Flannery from The Office was the special guest. Dana Carvey, of course, was there. Uh, had a blast. Uh, with my other two competitors that I got to work with, they were a lot of fun. Afterwards, we're all all of us were outside. Uh, us, Dan Carvey, uh, Freddie Prince Jr. We're hanging out, taking pictures. Uh, and Dana Carvey leans in and tells me, "He's just like, hey, you got a great ear for voices. You got a great mm -hmm. ear. Keep doing what you're doing." And I'm like, "Fuck, <laughs> that's uh, oh, can I curse? No, yeah, 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 we're good, we're good." 
Oh yeah, fantastic. I was like, fuck. Uh, <laughs> I was like, that's uh, that's amazing to hear from someone who is known for primarily doing amazing impressions. Um, and I, I even hear from Freddie Prince Jr. as we're still filming. Uh, like the the winner had just been announced. We're kind of like cheering, doing the waving goodbye. Like that's the show. Blah blah. blah. We're done. Uh, you know, wrapping up. Everyone's like, oh, great job, great job. Freddie Prince Jr. leans in, and you can see this on the episode if you can ever find it anywhere. But he leans in, he, like I'm shaking his hand. He leans in, and he goes, "Hey, man, this was the close. We've been filming all week this week, and this was the closest the voting has ever been. You were off by that by just that much." And I'm like, "Really, Freddie Prince Jr.? You just told me I lost ten thousand dollars, dude. Why would you say that?" To me? <laughs> Why would you say that, Freddie Prince Jr.? Right. Why would you say that? You could have just let me in ignorance. I would have just been like, ah, I could have lost by a lot or a little. I don't know. You just told me, hey, you almost got $10,000. <laughs> you know what's going to make this ice cream better, Freddie Prince Jr.? Knowing that I'm eating it and that I could have had an actual amazing thing instead of this cheat meal, you dick. Right. Right. Oh, man. Well, okay. Let, but, let's break that down, though, because... All, that's pretty cool on a number of regards. First of all, I didn't even get the chance to compliment that James L. Jones. Mwah, beautiful. Oh, Second of all, much, yeah. have you thought about opening a cameo as other people so that you can do impressions of people calling them and be like, yo, James Earl Jones called me today. This is dope, dude. He left my voice message. I have thought about uh, – because everyone can – a lot of you – because everyone with – so much social media stuff keeps on popping up, like so like TikTok and and Cameo, Twitch, uh, all this all this stuff. Uh, I've had it where a lot of people have told me like, "Yo, you need you need to get TikTok, you need to get this, you need to get that," and just do impressions on there. I'm just like, uh, like it's already it's already hard enough to juggle so many other social medias that already social media applications already have. Yeah. So a part of it's like, let me master one really quick and then figure out how to scale it down or utilize one and divvy it up amongst everything else. Makes sense. Makes so sense. So I, I had just got a TikTok. So I might be doing we might be doing some funny videos on there and then just moving over to my Instagram because that's where I'm primarily going to focus on. Um but yeah with the YouTube my YouTube channel that I'm I'm fixing up doing more impression videos. Uh me and my buddy uh, another comedian Jose Barrientos we had this idea to do uh, – he, he would do prank videos. <laughs> so I had this idea of doing a, a prank phone call video. Uh, I wanted to get him his, him involved in it. So we'd have to figure that one out. But that was an idea that I had a while back. So that, that the phone call idea is definitely in, in, is something that I've thought of. Okay. I'm just <laughs> trying to get you some extra cash, dude, because here's the thing I love oh, yeah, about yeah, – for, sure. for, for other people <laughs> who have jobs, like other you know athletes, they go – Join my Zoom class. Hey, everybody. Yeah. Here's me working out. And if you guys want to get on this, just donate. And people are like, oh, they're doing a good job during this coronavirus. They're providing a service yeah. to people. For comedians, it's like, we'll do it for free. And you go, yeah. okay, <laughs> well, I, I'm doing what I normally do. But normally you'd pay to see me at a club. Nah, I don't want to do that right now. We're all poor. So do your, do your song and dance for yeah. free. Yeah. So for me, I'm always thinking like, well, <laughs> screw these. These are good impressions. Yeah, I know those things yeah. don't happen overnight. I know when I was a kid, you know, again, like uh, Dana Carvey, Phil Hartman, those are the people at SNL when like people were like, oh my God, I love Chris Farley. And I was like, I like him too. But these guys who were doing character work on the background, like I just yeah. I couldn't take my eyes off of them. And then trying to learn the craft of developing an impression and refining it to go from, oh, that's a good impression to, oh, that's a great bit. That's funny. Yeah. That takes time. It's, it, it, def yeah, it definitely does because I, for a long time, when I first started, I didn't want to do impressions at all. Like at the like when I started, I was good at doing voices. I knew how to do characters. I knew how to do this and that. Had no interest in doing it in my stand-up whatsoever because in my mind, I was like, oh, I don't want to be like – the the blank guy yep yep you know what i mean like oh that's the puppet guy oh that's the this the guitar guy Absolutely. oh that's uh that's the impression guy i did i had a such a big fear of becoming that and then i started thinking about him just i was just like well if i just do all it is is just me rattling off impressions that's what i'll be but if i work on the writing and it's rather me the joke is rather uh it's a joke that happens to have a pun, have have an impression, mm. rather than a joke that just is an impression. 
or that's a mirror that's holding it up to the character that you've seen from the movie or from when yeah. you recognize them, which is usually yeah. what I see is the difference between an entry level uh, impression and something that has uh, merit that you can tell and say like, Hey, pay me for this is when you come to see me to the club, this is worth your time. I think this is something I think yeah. is funny. I hope you will too. Yeah. You know, you kind of know what the, what the, the energy and the vibe you're going to get because you know, like, Oh, well that, that person does impressions. That person does voices. Uh, so you, you kind of, you kind of have, you kind of have a feel for like what you might expect in, in the shows that I'll put on. Um, like I'm going to, I focus on my writing. So there's jokes that like, I try to write jokes where if impression wasn't even there, you mm -hmm. wouldn't notice right. as well. Uh, but for the most part, if I can throw in a, a, vo a funny voice an impression, a character in, it makes it even funnier and it just keeps the room just feeling more like we're having fun. Uh, and that's, that's always what I've strived for with, with my standup. Okay, I, I need to workshop this one with you because I saw you do this and I thought it was good. <laughs> and the reason why is I – there are some impressions that I don't finalize. I just say like, mm -hmm. oh, it'd be nice if I did that one, but I'm not going to touch it right now. But the one that sticks out to me that I saw you crush was your Ian <laughs> McKellen. And the only tuning fork I had – and I tell people tuning fork is that word. It's like that Christopher Walken wow that like gets you into yes. the impression. The tuning fork yeah. I had – for uh, Ian McKellen was just the way he says the cure or Charles. And those were the only two hints. And I was like, I have nothing else other than those two things. So what is the key yeah. to doing a good Ian McKellen impression? For me, uh, I, I like doing, because there's, because that's the funny thing, like with, especially like someone like Christopher Walken. Yeah. Like everyone has a Christopher Walken, everyone has a Schwarzenegger, everyone has um, oh, what's another one? Everyone has an Apacino, yep. uh, but everyone has specific ones. Uh, I, I learned something a long time ago, especially from doing voiceover and stuff, is that even a bad impression is a is an original voice. Right. So that's the way I look at it. Uh, with so that way I can be more respectful to people who I'm like. That is that doesn't sound anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> so rather than say like, dude, that that was a terrible, right? That was a terrible Eddie Murphy that you just did. Rather than saying that, it is easier and it's a much nicer and a better way to look at it. If I'm Absolutely. like, you know what? Even even if you don't hit it, even if you don't hit it right away, it sounds good. But that is like the one thing I always tell people because it's hard for me to describe how to do impressions uh, physically, like how to physically mm -hmm. tell them like, this is how you. This is how you, you make the nose like this. This is how you make your throat down here. This is how you do all this stuff to contort your voice and, and make it sound this, this way or that way. I always say, watch something over and over again that somebody's saying, a, fr a, a key phrase that they say, and go from there. For me, it's, uh, uh, well, now let's see here. Yes. Well, we're going, we're going to have to we're work a little harder on just just getting the right tone just right there. And once you have the proper word, you can say anything. It's magic. It's just, you know what it is? It's just, <laughs> again. But the thing is, is like, because I do other impressions, I say, mm, it's not there. And I think I, I attune it to people where you know your range like in song. So you know if you can hit a certain mm -hmm. note. So to me, I would tell people yeah. like, oh, hey, one of my biggest tricks actually used to be what I used to teach for speech and debate. And I used to coach these kids who would compete on a weekly basis on a national scene. And when I would go up to them, I'd like tell them, I'd be like, okay, well, I'm going to teach you how to do this. Here's how to maybe correct that one part that you were doing, or here's how to do that. Mm -hmm. And if they wouldn't get it right after about three times of explaining, I just do my impression of them. And then they'd yeah. look at me and they'd go, why didn't you just do that? Like, I know that's me. So why didn't you just do the impression of me to do that? I was like, well, because I want to believe my words are good. But if my words fail right. me or you're too stupid, then I've got to resort to this. And I've got 20 minutes of <laughs> shtick on you and I would rather not make you feel bad. So pick your poison, right. there, kids. But uh, <laughs> do you remember the first impression that you did? Like, what was the first impression that you remember doing? Oh, man. Uh, I remember because I got into comedy to, to make my dad laugh. 
Uh, now I now I can give two shits whether he laughs or not. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but but originally as a kid, as a kid, my goal was always to make my dad laugh because he is a he's always been a tough person to make laugh. Yep. Um, one thing that he would laugh at was I remember we used to watch the Looney Tunes together, classic Looney Tunes cartoons together. Uh, there was a I remember there was one there was two specific things that he that he loved to hear me do, which was uh, Porky Pig saying hot tamales uh, and uh, uh, Foghorn Leghorn. Uh, I have actually met Bob Bergen, who does the voice of Porky Pig, and after hearing it done so well, I have refused to ever attempt it. <laughs> <laughs> And it's been so long since I've heard Foghorn Leghorn that it, it's just going to come off like not sounding like him. <laughs> you know, there, there's no need. There's, that, I, there's not an egging you into doing anything you don't need yeah, to. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember those are the two things I remember doing, trying to mimic. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, those are the two voices I was trying to mimic because I remember it, it wasn't so much me saying the words as much as it was how they were saying it. Yep. Uh, so that's... As far back as I can remember, that those are the first two voices I ever attempted to do. Uh, was always Looney Tunes, always cartoon characters, and then once I started learning what celebrities were and started learning their the habits that certain people have when they speak, I started listening to those, the speech patterns, the pacing, and everything. So, and you can even look at it with like people who who are done to death. Uh, Al Pacino, mm-hmm. his his voice is it hasn't always been just. It hasn't always just been like just down here and everything, you know. We used to used to have kind of even more of a softer voice and everything, but now when he, you know, <laughs> he's much older. He takes his time. And, oh, he, I like to I like to say draws that, out his word. <laughs> I like to say that Al Pacino once he got to about like early nineties was just perpetually lost and surprised he was somewhere. So it'd be like the first few <laughs> seconds would just be him looking around and be like, what do I do now? All right. Yeah. You know, and then you'd, you'd go into the fun. But to me, like I used impressions as a way to get people to go see good movies. So I would mm. tell them, I'd be like, there's a great scene in the movie heat. Everybody should go see heat. Now I'm like barely like what? <laughs> 10, 13 when yeah, that movie's listen, out. For anybody, for anybody watching or listening, if you haven't seen the movie heat, <laughs> go see it. But here's the thing. I'm leading the charge as a teenager <laughs> yeah. to be like, no, 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 no. I know. I know. The rock is great. That's a great movie. But the movie yeah. heat is so good. And they're like, dude, it's three hours. And I'm like, I don't care, dude. There's a great scene. And I would tell him, yeah. like, there's a great scene where he's literally like, she's got a great ass. And like, people are like, Oh, I, I want to see that. And I go, whatever gets yeah. you there, dude, I'm glad that's happened. So, you know, I, but the thing is, is like, I, I love the differentiation between old Pacino and, and young Pacino because young Pacino was so yeah. subtle and he, you know, he, all of his mannerisms and character work, was, you, it was you so good. Have... <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just, I was complimenting that. I, a lot of people oh. can only do one era of a person and yeah. they don't recognize so, that like, they change things. Yeah. There, you know, there's very, not a ton of examples because, uh, you know, especially when you got to try to find someone who's like the, you can hear the inflections and everything change over time. So Al Pacino is a great example because you watch like something like The Godfather. Yep. You get hints of, of his of his voice that he has now, but it's much softer. It's much more calm. It's it doesn't has no gravel to it. Yep. And as you keep going through his filmography, yeah, it's the gravel starts coming in, the tone, the the cadence, the the beats, everything starts to, to align. And yeah. same thing with like Jack Nicholson. You yep. know, he when he was younger, you know, Jack was just uh he was like a lot of smooth talker. He was a <laughs> casual kind of guy. And then as he got older, you know, he uh, started getting more of that growling nature. And you started hearing the pattern that he would always say in everything he was in. No, you don't know. It's <laughs> just, it's like Pacino. It's just <laughs> down there and who gives a fuck. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's so great because I felt like modern Jack Nicholson really solidified himself. It was like he watched a movie of himself in the 70s when he was doing the movie Batman. 
<laughs> and just goes, oh, I can do an impression of that guy, but just bigger. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Let me go do this. And since then, <laughs> it's just been him having a good time being Hollywood's that guy. Like when he would show yeah. up at the Oscars and just be in the front row. And if you're Billy Crystal, you're like, if this row, isn't sun, working. Sunglasses. Yeah, if this bit's not working, Jack's right in front of there. I got I got one out yep. that I'm going to look at, and I'm going to, Jack, you're right here with me, bud. Thank you so much. Can I ask this? Because I, I don't know that I want to get too inside baseball, but has there ever been an yeah. impression that you were just like, nah, it's just not happening? Uh, like, in, like, like the one that I tried and I, was, I just gave up on? Not even give up on, but that you just kind of said, maybe not now, or – Oh, you know what? I started to do this and then I saw somebody else had one. And until I come up with something a little bit outside that realm, I have to wait. It's for me, a lot of it is people you wouldn't really expect mm. that that could have be done in a like I'm blown away by like there's other impressionists that I follow, like Ross Marquand from Walking Dead, uh, an amazing impressionist. Uh, a lot of my buddies that have been on first impressions with me, Peter Marr, Justin Ruffel. Uh, Angela Hoover, uh, and so many other people, um, all amazing, all great. Uh, and there's some, there's always like voices I think everyone has in their catalog that other impressionists will look at and be like, damn, I wish I knew how to do that person. Yeah. I wish I could do a better version of that person. For me, it would probably be a few people. Uh, Jeff Bridges, I feel like I don't have him nailed down. Uh, that's why I keep on fine tuning. I keep on trying, but I never feel like, oh, that's a, that's perfect for, 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 for what I think is good. Like that, that's perfect. Um, it'd be Jeff Bridges, uh, uh, Tracy Morgan and Christoph Waltz are the okay. three that I've like <clears throat> tried. Yeah. I've tried, I've tried. And there's like, mo there's like in small instances where I, I'm like, oh, I got it. That's it. That's it right there. And I just lose it. And yeah. I'm like, damn. All right. So it's one of those things where I just gotta, I have to find an anchor word or an anchor phrase that yeah. will, keep me in the pocket and keep me keep me there but those are three voices that I've, I've always struggled with well I've, I've always told people that you know it's a muscle too where there have been impressions oh, yeah. where i'll be doing it and i'm like that's that's not where that's supposed to be you know like you'll hear it come out right. and you go like ah, no i gotta fine tune that when i get a chance but i definitely um and I, I think this is a credit to you what you're doing uh one of the things i found on the mma side is i started doing impressions of fighters and I realized, mm -hmm. like, no one's going to have these impressions. And if they do, they're not going to be, like, kind of my take on them. So then I started being like, oh, mm -hmm. let's take that skill and let's put it into where I go when I'm not doing comedy for just, like, late night stuff. Let's do it for with the MMA and jiu-jitsu crowds. <clears throat> and I found that, like, those little outside the realm ones. So when I saw that you had a video in which you're doing some Pixar impressions... I'm like, okay, again, <laughs> that's taking us outside the wheelhouse of here's my Schwarzenegger. Here's this guy that you know down the street. Like, yeah. Here are a set of unique things that are mega popular that so many people have seen. So it's almost like doing a new celebrity now. Yeah. Yeah, because you do you do have like all these characters from like animation, even from TV shows, from movies, um, where they're the actor isn't necessarily doing their natural voice right. it's not their natural voice it's modified or they're doing something different or they're adding their own flair to it so it, it is a completely different impression altogether yep. um uh you know uh they're like there's like certain uh certain actors so like say like uh tom hardy uh <laughs> I've been trying. I've been trying to work on this video where I'll do some something similar. Where it's all all Tom Hardy characters, and it's all just different types of grunts, <laughs> uh, different types of grunts or mumbles, because those are all every role he's ever in. It's always. <laughs> like you could just mumble all your words. But the mumbles will sound like Tom Hardy. <laughs> yep. So I've been trying to figure that one. I've been trying to figure that one out and write it out. Well, it's hard to write out grunts, but trying to execute and plan it properly. <laughs> you know, if you cut it the right but, way, people will understand it. It's just 
Will you yeah. literally be able to explain it to someone else? Mm. But yeah, if you hold up a picture of like, <laughs> if you say like, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Tom Hardy's on the show called Peaky Blinders. Yes. Uh, and, you know, his, his character kind of talks like this. He has a very loose jaw. Uh, he, he, he talks to the back of his face. That's what he does, <laughs> right? Yeah. And simply, you know, it's hard to understand a single word he says. And so, like, I hear it, and I got, I'm like, I, you can even hear kind of near the end, like, I kind of lost a little, went a little toothy, but that's, like, something I hear for, mm. and, and I'm like, oh, that's a completely different character compared to, to Bane, which is, oh, you think you adopted the dog? I was born in it, molded by it. I didn't see the light, and blah, 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 whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's so weird, because it's like, you know, I'm, everybody... I'm not auditioning for the role. Yeah, hey, you know what? They did Bane. I think we're good for a while. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, is like when I when I saw Bane come out, you know, we mm-hmm. already had all this weird talk about Batman voice, and then we were like oh, this Bane voice, and then I, I realized that's all people want. They don't care if it, it like they're going to complain that it's bad. They're going to be like, I don't like it. But guess what? That's the new thing that everybody's going to do. <laughs> so yeah. for me, I was like. You know, people would write off Tom Hardy, and I was like, yo, he's really good, dude. <clears throat> like, this yeah. guy, <clears throat> he makes you so invested in a character that he's willing to do batshit crazy things to mm-hmm. make the characters come across. So, <clears throat> I have a huge appreciation for that. Um, I want to circle back to this. So, yeah. <clears throat> outside of what was happening, when did you have to stop doing the comedy? for our current situation i guess when did you have to go so, oh things have to adapt here it, it's very funny so i was in portland at the time uh, okay. i was doing a weekend of shows uh i got there on a wednesday and at the time it, everything was kind of like everything was very still kind of on the cautious side everyone was there wasn't really any kind of order to ever, for everyone to be in self isolate. Yeah. It was kind of more recommended that, like, hey, if if you don't need to go out, maybe don't go out. Right. All right. Maybe limit how how much everyone's going out. That, that's all it was. That's all it was at the time. So I, while I was in Portland, it all started ramping up more. And so I did my first show, which was on a Wednesday, and I had a show on Thursday and Friday. Both got canceled. Uh, and started thinking like, well, Saturday was supposed to be my show or my big show where I was supposed to get paid, this and that. Shit. And then I had a show on, supposed to do a show on Sunday and then I fly back on Monday. So I'm like thinking, I'm like pa- having anxiety attacks, panicking. So I'm like, I have, all right, I got to call it. Like, all right, I got to cancel my Sunday show. I have to buy a flight back for Sunday. And luckily my, my buddy who runs the show uh, on Saturday told me straight up that this is still happening. I'll, I'll make sure I take care of you because you lost because I lost out on like a good amount, a good of, work amount of money for that weekend alone. Right. Yeah. So that was the whole the whole reason I was in Portland to begin with was to do shows and enjoy Portland. Couldn't do either of those things. Uh, Portland was basically on the verge of just closing. And then all these shows are being oh, cautious. Rightfully so. We're being cautious and saying, hey, we're going to cancel to be safe. And it's like, all right, I understand. but. That's the whole reason I came here. <laughs> right. So right around then is when I was like, I, I might need to start looking to stop booking shows, stop, you know, stop pre- prepping and buying, uh, buying plane and travel tickets and everything. Yeah. Uh, so right when I flew back, that's when everything was kind of like, everyone stay inside, self-isolation, everyone stay inside, quarantine, whatever. So that's when everything started happening. So. So like right away, like I was like in the middle of doing everything and feeling so motivated and amped and feeling so much momentum and everything was like, oh, nah, hold, it. hold on, you got to go, got to go inside. I'm like, shit. <laughs> 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 so it was literally while I was, while I was on the road that I, I, I kind of realized like I have to get off the road. <laughs> and I mean, the thing that people don't talk I'm, about on, on this respect for comics, I, I believe is nobody understands that that moment that they say, all right, travel ban, or they go, okay, now 
go isolation. <clears throat> you have to get home to isolation. Like you're not just yeah chilling at your house being like, well, comedy's happening here, so no big deal. Yeah. You actually have to like travel home, so there's also safety concerns for yourself. So, you know, it's nice yeah. when people say like, oh, you can just shut down things and work from home. And it's like, not really, if this is your yeah, bad, you know? And as someone who suffers from anxiety and paranoia, being, uh, being in a different state, uh, not even at a hotel, at an Airbnb, uh, and just constantly hearing all this news that, hey, everything's going to shut down or things are starting to shut down or starting to tell people to stay indoors. That's when I'm like, well, I just got to make it to Saturday, yeah. uh, make that money or, or earn that money and then just fly home and just yep. like I'll, I'll eat, I'll eat whatever money I already spent. But I just got to I just got to get back before I'm stuck here with no plan. Right. <laughs> so the entire so that's like it just. The whole thing just threw a gigantic wrench and just everything all at once. Um, but I mean, uh, like we were talking about earlier, like now's the time to take advantage of the of the opportunity that you, that we all have that we're indoors. Uh, find especially as uh, people for us who are on the creative side, you know, um, it's not five years ago where we were so limited on the technology or the equipment that everyone had at their disposal. Now everyone has, everyone has an iPhone or smartphone. Everyone has a tripod. Everyone has some kind of light. It's so easy to make something. So yeah. I've been trying to utilize my time to plan things out and just be ready for once everything starts up again, just be ready to go out and just start hit the ground running on, on what I want to, um, stuff I want to do and stuff I've been, Stuff that got put on hold. Well, here's the thing that I found is, you know, I was laughing with people uh, because I saw all these hosts have to go to like self seclusion hosting shows and putting on the Zooms mm -hmm. and all this sort of thing. And I'm like, I've been podcasting for years. I've been prepping for this since like day one. Yeah. So like, <laughs> you know, I I've had a very nice uh, guest of the show after we were done filming. Basically, tell me they were like, dude, I saw Seth Meyers' this shit. And then I saw your stuff. And I'm like, that's NBC. How the fuck do they not have a background? Like, how the hell do they not have right. more equipment than you? And I was like, got to be honest with you, dude. That was a big <laughs> motivator is I was like, oh, I have this stuff. And now we have yeah. more tools at our disposal to create some fun things and do things like that. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's just it's all those things that I think people go through is, all right, how long are we here? <clears throat> and what are we doing? Right. And how long till we get audiences again? You know, right. like now we're all at that point where we're just yeah. kind of like, man, I wish somebody would heckle me. Like, Jesus. <laughs> just, the, I just, <clears throat> let me perform for a bachelorette party. Why not? <laughs> I'll, I'll deal. I'll deal with the, yeah, I'll deal with that. I don't care. <laughs> if that, so <laughs> I actually, I actually want to engage with them. Like, tell me about your party. <laughs> so you you mentioned this and I don't know if you do have a bachelorette party that you performed for but do you have a worst gig story because I, you don't have to give every thing about it but no one just throws out a well I mean Raph not that I've ever had to perform at a bachelorette party <sighs> but <laughs> so to me I'm like wh where is that joke is it in truth do you have I've something never... to that I've never had to perform. I've never had a bachelorette party at a, at a comedy show, which uh, is not uncommon. Like right. there's, you know, a lot of times there are bachelorette parties that come through. I've had it where a bachelor's party came through, which was seemed sad. We all made fun of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit of a reverse. Like if it's a bachelorette party, it's it could really it could really upset the flow of the show. If right. it's a bachelor party. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna poke fun at them all day. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, but my worst gig, uh, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you one that I, I was a gig that I was booked for. I didn't. I never performed. Um, so I'm performing in, I believe, West Hollywood, like deep into West Hollywood, maybe even uh, around uh, Burbank uh, area. Uh, but this is like almost like middle of nowhere. Uh, I rolled up to this place. Uh, it looks like maybe just like an office building or a house. I wasn't unsure, but to think of it, 
I go through the gates, I meet up with my buddies, and I'm like, hey, what is this place? Uh, this whole backyard area looks like a uh, birthday just happened for a kid. And I'm looking around, I'm like, what? This looks like someone's backyard. And he's just like, yeah, this is a, this is a sex club. And I'm like, this is a what? <laughs> so he tells me that we were going to be performing for this uh, sex club. And he's like, you want me to give you a tour? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, point, well, we're here. Yeah. Tour. So we go walking around and what appears to be a BDSM dungeon. Uh, nobody in it. Nobody in anything. Everything was unoccupied. Uh, or, or vacant, I should say. Uh, so nobody was strapped down or nothing. But we're walking through and everything is clear. Like, oh, this is all for BDSM stuff. The, the cages, wheels, uh, stocks, and all this. Stuff. I'm like, okay, but we're just sitting. It felt, and I'm like, it felt like a birthday party had just happened. So we're sitting there, we're waiting, we're all enjoying <laughs> the food that they had there. And they're like, oh, you guys be, you guys be the comedians. And I'm like, yeah, we're, we're the comedians. Like, oh, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. I'm like, are, are we? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, but we're waiting so long. I think maybe like two hours had passed by from what we were initially told was going to be the performance time. And me and uh, one other guy, we had drove up from Pomona. Uh, so this was already a bit of a drive. So we were, we were just like, hey, dude. We told the guy who booked us. We're like, hey we're going to leave. Like, <laughs> it's been, it's been two hours. Like if the show's not happening, it's not happening. Like, yeah, that's on them. So we, I ended up leaving. So that was probably maybe the weirdest thing I ever been booked for, mm. but the worst show I've ever, I, I, I mean, there's never really been a, a time where I can, I can think of where I've had like just a show that I, I'm like, that was horrible. I lied. I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, oh, hold on. And I want people to understand the context of this. So you had the point of being like, you know, I was at this uh, BDSM thing and that was okay, but I didn't perform there. But really, I haven't. Oh, there's that one. Yeah. Mm. So I'm doing I'm doing a run at uh, casinos uh, in, in, in deep in Arizona or no, deep in Nevada, um, like deep Nevada. Uh Nevada and Arizona, I should say, because we also, we, we had Laughlin and all that. Um, but we're doing all these casinos, and none of my jokes were landing. Nobody was on board with what I was saying. I looked like this, uh, which is already hard for people to get behind. Uh, <laughs> but this is, it's like deep Arizona, deep Nevada, uh, very older white audiences, uh, you know, it felt very more conservative areas. I'm up here talking about gender identity and being Latino and doing impressions. And I am just drenched in sweat for every show because it is so it is I am pulling teeth to get these people on board with what I'm saying for <laughs> every show. I'm not bombing, but it is clear that I'm struggling <laughs> <laughs> on every last show. I think maybe the second show was probably the worst because it was a much older audience, much older than maybe all the other shows. Mm. Um, we get through it. Uh, I at, Now I'm driving from this area called uh, Pine Top in Arizona all the way to the Phoenix to do more shows, okay. uh, which are more comedy, uh, more in comedy. You know, all were in comedy clubs and everything. Um, as I'm driving, I get a call from the guy who from the company who booked me for these casinos telling me, Hey, we just wanted to say, uh, thank you for doing the weekend. Really appreciate it. Uh, want to let you know your, your checks in the mail. So it should be on its way. Uh, this is the part, this is the phone call we hate making, but we are going to have to cancel your shows that we had booked for you at Pachanga. And I'm like, well, why? And they're like, well, we got calls from the casinos saying they didn't feel like you were up as up to par with other comedians we've sent down there. Uh, it seemed like you maybe were struggling or you, you didn't have a consistent, ha uh, uh, consistent set on some shows. And I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to figure out this audience <laughs> the entire time though. I'm cracking up. I'm laughing. Cause I'm like, <laughs> I know they were bad shows. Yeah, this yeah. is not unwarranted. They were bad shows. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, 
we should you know, I, I always tell my I tell newer comics you shouldn't be afraid to bomb. Bombing is good. Yeah. Uh you should uh, you should never consider it like I suck. This it's all over. Now it's one audience. Chances are you're never gonna see that audience ever again. You might see those comics again, but you'll never see that audience again. So you just gotta you just gotta re impress one person, maybe. Yeah. You're fine. Um but yeah, so this was a show where these were shows that just like were just not going my way. The audience was just not on board with anything I was saying, not on board with the, <laughs> with obviously the way the way I present myself and everything. And, and I would try to give the best show I could. It didn't happen. So I ended up getting fired from a, another week of work, which I just laughed off because I mean, you can't you just can't stress about that stuff. And the bi- the the main thing was the check was in the mail. So <laughs> yeah, like honestly, dude, it's so funny when it, people don't understand that aspect of being like. Listen, it's a different story if you don't get paid, but if you get paid right. and it just didn't go well, you know, I want to go to their yeah. job where every day they're a plus because mm-hmm. let's face it, guys, I- I've seen a lot of people get away with a lot of shit at their jobs. And it makes me think like yeah. there's not really a hide behind in comedy. It works or it doesn't. And the stuff mm-hmm. that doesn't work, you either kind of science it and figure out, OK, maybe I can make that one. You know, I could adapt it or whatever. And then other days you just got to chalk it up to, all right, whatever. Tomorrow's another day. I got to get back to work. Like I tell people, yeah. like, we have certain people who were in a very troll based internet time and sphere. Yeah. And so a lot of people, want, say. <laughs> yes, we have a lot of people who feel like the quickest way to hurt you is to tell you what you do isn't good. And so right. as a result of that, you want to be like, oh no. Uh, this troll doesn't think I'm good. Like, uh, it's like, well, I've got a following and you don't. So get the fuck out of here. Right. I don't care. And more importantly, like I've always been the type that can register uh good self uh, criticism and, and do all that sort of stuff. So if people have constructive criticism, I'll look at their notes and be like, Oh, that's a good note. We should go 10 minutes shorter on this podcast or, uh, you know, what? they actually had a marginally good idea to book this person or do something like this. But if persons yeah. are just trying to come out there to be mean, whatever. But if you got paid and they're being mean, then it's like, well, cool. <laughs> now I've got a built in another set of people who are oh, going to love. No. <laughs> right. So oh, what a shame. <laughs> it's just one of those things that I tell people. I'm like, you know, it comes with the job and, you know, being a face. You mean I don't get to. <laughs> You mean I don't get to go back to that place that I did horribly at? Oh, no. Yeah. Right. And I'm sure, you know, especially when you get into the casino gigs, and you can't say this, but I can say it. Uh, but when you get into casino gigs, you know, it's not necessarily always going to be the type of folks that you have the most control over. Uh, right. So, you know, you definitely didn't bring that audience. It is, it's a different audience of being it, like, listen, this guy's really pissed because he lost his money. Now I got to come and save his day. And I'll say, you know, you always learn from failure. Uh, then that's more more true in the entertainment industry and in anything else. Uh, because doing those shows, you know, you learn who your audience is. You learn, you you learn what your demographic is. Because every show, I had at least a handful of people say, "We enjoyed ourselves. Yep, we enjoyed you." So. You know, I had to take that and say, well, I, cool, I got that. I got those audience members. I may not have gotten everybody, but I got those. I got those guys. And luckily, I wasn't the headliner. So I so I was going in cold, uh, <laughs> going in cold, uh, just unfamiliar with just like, all right, well, what's this whole area's vibe like? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you learn pretty quickly once you're up there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. Julian. But I take it I take it as a learning experience, though. Well, Julian, I want to start rounding up. But before I do, I want to make sure people know where they can find you. So I'm going to give you a chance. Plug anything you want. Plug, you know, a movie you saw. Do whatever the hell you want. This is your time to plug whatever <laughs> is in your heart and soul right now, good sir. Awesome. I appreciate it. Well, uh, you guys can find me on Instagram. I'm primarily on there. Uh, it's uh, Julian F. Comedy. J-U-L-I-A-N-F as in Frank and then Comedy as in comedy uh you guys can also find me on twitter and i will be coming out with brand new uh youtube videos very soon on my youtube channel uh if you follow my instagram you guys will be able to find it there and i'll be launching a brand new podcast as well uh it'll be called keeping sane with julian 
Uh, so you guys can also uh, subscribe when that comes out, hopefully very, very soon. And you know what? I'm also going to plug uh, Roast Battle's YouTube channel. Uh, go check them out. Uh, I've been thinking about hitting them up because I, got, I did get offered to go and battle and do a show, which seems like the closest thing because uh, I'm not all about the Zoom, the Zoom shows. I, you know, if you if you like them, I haven't seen any, so I, I can I can't really pass that much of judgment. I'm just not on board with just sitting basically at home and doing my jokes to a computer. But yeah. uh, with Roast Battle being a different show and having seen some of the battles I've been able to do, I'm like, all right, maybe I might I might I might try that. I gotta I just gotta perform again. So yeah. So hope, so go check out Roast Battle because uh, you know it's a show that's given me plenty of opportunities and uh, it's, a, it's a fun show to watch. Uh, Fridays at eight o'clock on the YouTube channel. That's great stuff. And I, so, I, yeah, the Roast Battle people have always been very nice. And and you know, hey man, if there's nothing more that we need uh, for entertainment right now is uh, watching some comedians go in on each other and and <laughs> being able to sit down <laughs> and watch it. There's something cathartic even for the audience members as they watch that yeah uh even though it's like you know everybody who mostly gets involved in these things uh, have a good sense of humor about like ah whatever you know it's for good fun good show um but i know like i've i've watched it and i just talked with jay light a couple weeks ago and you know hearing him tell me these stories about roast battle and watching him watch it and be a part of it like that is just like yeah, it sounds like the show we should be watching right now. So it's dope stuff. <laughs> well, Julia, yeah. before we let you go, one of the things that I have been asking people as we kind of circle around is I've been asking people, given this pandemic, given our cooped upness, what is the best advice that you have right now to help navigate this whole pandemic? Uh, keep your brain uh, going. Keep uh, your mind occupied. Be creative. Write read draw color uh play even play video games watch movies like just be creative because right now there's no excuse not to be creative and not just to enjoy yourself while you're indoors there's 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 always a way to do something and stay healthy as well you know you know don't just lie about the house uh exercise because that everything's gonna at the end of the day Yes, yeah, stay healthy physically, but also mentally is is also very important. So staying creative and staying busy and not just lounging around and and just uh, not doing anything is not going to be healthy for you in the long run. Uh, so stay connected, stay busy, and stay creative. It's good stuff. Well, Julian, I'm so happy for you, man. You know, uh, I just it's so funny when I I look at my inbox and I look and I see like yeah, you know. One of your last messages that you sent out to me, it's like, it's always so funny when you're on the other side of these things. Cause you just go like, listen, kid, I can tell you maybe two things, but you know what you need. You already know what you're going to do. And so for me, there's a certain greatness of when I do see you with Dana Carvey and I do see you headlining and I do see you doing all of these things. It's a reassurance that like, yeah, you knew you, you always had that stuff in you. So you were always destined to do these good things and i wish you continued success you're doing great things already man i appreciate it dude really do all right we'll be right back thank you guys so much for tuning into early late night we hope you're enjoying this uh, if you like us give us a like a subscription a share any one of those things we truly appreciate it um we hope you guys will come back and see us later this week but for now my name is rafa Sparza. thank you so much for watching be safe